Okay, our, tip, our standard opening announcements. Um, if you have a video camera on your device, um, uh, it's good to turn it on because it creates more community. Um, but if you're not speaking, you should turn off your, your, um, your microphone so that you know, when you suddenly have to talk to your, somebody living in your household or um, like me, my puppy starts barking, no, you're not interrupting the speaker. Um, uh, and um, you can uh, politely interrupt the speaker with audio with your question. You can put in chat that, hey, I have a question. Um, and I'll, one of us will try and get the speaker's attention. Um, uh, but we're using uh, Slack chat uh, rather than the chat in the, in the Meetup app or in the, in the Google Meet app. So if you're not on Slack, um, uh, please go join the Meetup channel um, in Drupal Slack, and you can get there from drupalnyc.org slash chat. I should get in that channel too. I'm in a different channel. Uh, meet up. There we go. Um, and uh, other announcements. Okay. Anybody hiring? They want to make an announcement. Okay, don't hear anyone. How about anybody looking? Hey everyone, I'm JD. I'm a freelance Drupal developer and uh, I'm looking for work. So if you've got a Drupal problem, hit me up. Awesome. It, He's a good we, guy. You should hire him. And part, we're part of the Drupal people running the Drupal camp and we're definitely looking for more organizers to help come aboard especially we want people to do uh, outreach to underserved communities. So if anyone's on that, we would love to have you aboard. No experience necessary. We, we, we meet weekly, and if you bring your own pizza, you can eat it. Um, that's about it, but the camp is going along very efficiently and very swiftly, and Vast, you know, you can give more information on that. Sure, I think I'll wait for the slide to come. Okay, no. sorry. But no, it's fine. Thank you. Okie dokie. So, um, Ben, are you here? I'm here. Yep. Awesome. Um, so, we've got Ben Horst, um, who's going to do a lightning talk for us. Great. Um, so lightning talk is 10 minutes, 15 minutes? Um, uh, yeah, you've got 15 if, uh, if you want, for sure. Sure. OK, cool. Okay. So um, oh, are we going to go through the, or should I just kick it off? You should just kick it off. So actually, oh, um, soon. I, I think this is a preview, it looks like. You've got so it. So you yeah. haven't emptied for a while. <laughs> um, so after the lightning talks, we've got Scott Walpo talking about a data management system. Um, um, John Pugh uh, reintroducing his product, Open Dev Shop, built on Drupal. Are you here, John? I think he mentioned he was uh, running late, and uh, okay. us will be oh. the last to speak tonight. Great. Um, so uh, I'm Sean Duncan. Um, that was JD Leonard. Um, we heard earlier. We heard um, Ho Ling talk about uh, working on her certificate problem. Um, and I saw Chris Bandit log in. Anything you want to say, Chris? Nah, not really. <laughs> OK. Um, uh, we're your organizers. We're on Twitter. We're on Slack. And we'd be happy if you joined us. Please, please, please support the Drupal Association. Um, they demand that we met as an association our half million dollar funding goal in 30 days. But um, no, without the Drupal Association, there's no Drupal.org. Without Drupal.org, there's no contributed modules. Um, there's no distribution of Drupal projects. Um, all that would be really bad for us. So uh, please, uh, 
Get yourself a membership. I've got one. Upcoming events. Um, uh, Drupal GovCon doesn't say it's virtual, but you know it's going to be. Um, and uh, we're planning a Drupal camp coming up in the fall. I think there's a slide for that coming up. This is the slide. Vasil. OK, so hello, everyone. Um, we're planning a Drupal camp, as you uh, may know. So we have two dates. We want to keep our uh, options open. We have October 30th and 31st and November 13th and 14th. We're waiting, waiting for our venue to confirm uh, the dates and just choose one. Uh, our venue sponsor is Microsoft. Thank you, Microsoft. So we'll see what the situation will be like with all this COVID things, uh, and we'll keep you updated, of course. So uh, we, as Scott mentioned earlier, we need uh, volunteers. So if you want to get involved, uh, write us at uh, camp-volunteer at drupalmc.org. If you're interested in sponsoring, sponsoring uh, our camp this year, uh, write us to camp-sponsors at uh, drupalmc.org. Also, you can visit our website, 2020.drupalcamp.nyc. You can find all the helpful information there. And uh, just you know, stay tuned, follow us on Twitter. There are more interesting things to come reg regarding the camp. We have really, really good uh, set of people uh, working hard to organize this year's camp. So stay tuned. Okay, and back, chasing my puppy. Um, so we've got a website, um, and um, it, we would be love to have your help. Um, you know, we were uh, on a different dom domain, and uh, we needed to move domains, and it seemed like we're at Drupal NYC. We ought to have a Drupal site. So the site we have is based on a contributed theme that I, sl that I slammed together in a weekend. Um, and it could use some love. So please join the website improve channel in Drupal NYC Slack and uh, help us improve our website. The cobbler's kids often have no shoes. So, do you have something in Drupal you'd like to talk about? Um, send us an email. You'll hear from JD. We'll get you scheduled um, and uh, we'll get your content up on an upcoming Meet up. We did his hiring. Alex isn't here, but that's his son, and he gets a plug every, every month, even though when Alex isn't here. So, introductions. Um, take a moment to introduce yourselves on the Meetup channel in Drupal NYC Slack. If you joined us late, you don't know how to get to Drupal NYC Slack, it's down here in the footer of our slide. Um, go to drupalnyc.org slash slack. Okay, today's lightning talk um, is by Ben Horst. I will stop presenting, and so Ben can jump in and here. I will be happy to take over presenting. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, everyone. So what I'm going to show you today is 
It's called EvolveEd, and it is a website we've built in Drupal 8. Um, and its purpose is to create an online community for learning and teaching. So we are actually a marketplace for anyone who is interested in tutoring any subject whatsoever to list their capabilities, the skills, the things they're interested in teaching, and find customers on the site. Can everyone see my shared screen? OK, so what we're looking at here is actually when you log into EvolveEd, this is the overview of all of the subjects that have been created by members of our community. So each person who joins starts off as a student. And then when they have a skill or something that they want to share and teach, they, they convert themselves to an expert. Um, and an expert just means you have a particular skill that you want to share. Some people feel a little shy about using the term expert because they don't feel that they've risen to that particular level. But we use the term to mean someone who's going to be a teacher or a tutor. Uh, and then an expert will go ahead and create subjects. And the subjects can be pretty much anything. As you see here, there's baking, and there's trombone, and there's French language, and Greek language. The idea is people are multifaceted. So if they teach one particular subject, we want to make sure that that subject gets sufficient attention so they can have a trombone subject. But the same person may also have a number of other skills, and we want them to be highlighted sufficiently so they can create another subject. The same person could teach Greek language or ballet or multiple additional subjects. And that's the general structure of our website. So there's students, tutors, and subjects. And when you log in, um, you actually land on the dashboard. And the dashboard page here is a feed of content. So those subjects that we just looked at, each person who has created one can actually post content relevant to that subject. And when I choose to follow those subjects, the content shows up in my dashboard here. So you can see camping skills posts. Well, that's my own post. Um, but also other people. Milo has posted about economics that he teaches. And uh, Jonathan and his guitar. So it's all, it's all collected in this one feed for me. And this is a feature that we've implemented to try to build a community of learners. We're not just a marketplace. We don't want to only be a place where people come to find a tutor and then disappear. We want them to actually participate in this community. So we've built features like this that make it much more than just a discovery platform for a tutor. It's a platform for learning. So if I'm interested in learning guitar, I can follow Jonathan's subject guitar, but I might find other teachers who also teach guitar. And I can follow all of them. Then my feed will be full of all of their content. That does a couple of things for me. It lets me see the personalities of each person who's writing posts and get a feel for the ones that might be the most interesting or might be the be most compatible with me. And that'll help me to choose a tutor that I can work with more effectively over the longer term. It also gives me the opportunity to learn quite a bit, even without investing my money in hiring a tutor. So I can learn the, the whatever it is that Jonathan shares, or Elisa here, she's teaching about graphic design. So I can, I can develop a pretty good comprehensive base of knowledge about these subjects just by following and interacting with others on the platform. Um, but ultimately, the goal of the platform is to introduce students to teachers. So when I find one that is a good fit, I can click on this, and I can see the subject detail page. This is Jonathan's guitar subject. He's got an intro video. So I can use that also to get a bit more of a feel for how he operates. And then this is the button that I clicked earlier so that I'm following Jonathan and, and consuming his content. But if I want to actually book a lesson with Jonathan, the site has a built-in calendaring platform. So he has already gone ahead and listed what times he's available. And you can see he's available a lot. So I can just put an uh, invitation on his calendar, fill out these details, and reserve a session with him. So this functionality is pretty familiar. I mean, a lot of folks have things like Calendarly that do this. Um, when I reserve the session, it'll send me a reminder email, and it will send him an email asking him to accept the session. So if he does that, then at that time that I've set tomorrow, we'll both log into the site and will be connected through our in-browser video conferencing. We designed it to be in the browser because we didn't want users to have to download any additional software. Um, you know, Zoom, you have to download Zoom. Google Meet takes more of our approach in which everything is browser-based. 
the thinking is that there are folks who don't have access to their own computer. So they can't download software. If you're using a public library or a shared computer or something like that, or if you're using a, a mobile a mobile device, um, our system works on all of these platforms. And that's meant to allow us to reach out to a larger audience, people who are maybe underserved or, or who just don't have enough money to buy all of this equipment because we want to connect them to our learning community and offer them these kinds of opportunities that they may not otherwise have. So the interface for our um, video classroom, I'm gonna show you one that I was invited to a little while ago. It expired because this was some days back, but this is the in-browser video classroom. And so this is embedded within our Drupal website. And if Vic and I signed in, we would just see our video here, same as what we see in Google Meet's interface. We've got the share screen function up top, the typical mute audio, mute video, et cetera. And in the top right, this is a countdown clock. So in a paid scenario, where a tutor has set their, their billing rate, say $30 an hour, you would see this clock count up. And when they reach the limit of the session, they would end the session. But they might finish earlier, they may finish later. So this uses the hourly rate times the um, amount of time spent to automatically determine what the precise billing would be. Now, the actual full implementation of that is a future feature that hasn't been released yet but we are building that out now, and then that'll be available later. So people who use our platform today um, have to pay each other through a third-party app. They can use Venmo, they can use PayPal, they can use whatever they wish. Um, but this uh, allows them to easily calculate how much time has been spent. Um, if you want to see our search interface, so we're using Solar on the back end. We're actually hosted on Pantheon, so I'm sure folks are familiar with that. There is someone um, here. No results because there's no subject by his name. But if we look at the other facet, the experts, then here's Scott. And so Scott has created a Drupal subject on our platform. Um, we are working with a couple of different focused verticals to launch the platform. We've only been live for a couple of months now. but. Um, we're very interested in developing specific communities on our site in terms of finding ways to leverage, uh, to, to, to promote ourselves and get some attention in the marketplace. We think that's the, the winning strategy. So one of those areas is technical training. I actually spoke to the WordPress meetup group a couple of weeks ago. And one of their first questions was, what version of WordPress did you build this on? I, I said, I'm sorry, <laughs> it's Drupal. <laughs> um, but I quickly dug myself out of that hole. Um, so here's Scott's course in Drupal, Getting Started. And he said his hourly rate. We can book a lesson with him, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one of the things that I want to talk about today is how I think this can be a useful tool for Drupal freelancers and Drupal developers. Because in the Drupal world, we've seen, I think, some pretty clever business models where a lot of the development shops have at least two major lines of business. One is developing and building and releasing websites directly, but a lot of them have supplemented that with training programs. So there are pre-recorded broadcast training programs, and there's a lot of different variants on that model. We see uh, using Evolve Ed to create a Drupal or PHP or you know any related development subject as a way for small scale individual developers to go ahead and, and supplement your source of income with kind of a complementary approach. So you may be out there doing jobs for companies as, you're, as you can, but it's also interesting, I think, and, and valuable to have this additional line, which is teaching other people how to use Drupal. Um, and we think our platform is really well suited for that. So uh, this is an invitation for members to come and test out this platform to join our online community here to also build an additional source of potential income over the long term and do other things that help to strengthen the Drupal community over time. So we're very interested in feedback, comments, or thoughts on this platform. We'd be happy to talk about it with anybody or, you know, offline or in any format that feels appropriate. Um, I think I'm about 15, no. Got some time. Um, if, if there's any questions, let me know. You want to have a question for Ben? Well, 
I'm looking forward to teaching people on this because I enjoy teaching. Um, I have some of my students from the CWA on the call now, on the, on the meetup. And I like it because when I first began, people taught me and I could return the effort out to the community. Yeah, that's a major factor for us. We really like the idea of, of, of kind of giving back to the community. Yeah. I mean, so much of my career has been around Drupal or, or got kickstarted by Drupal and, and uh, the community is just one of the most interesting things I've been involved with. So we are building out some additional features over time. As I mentioned, one of them is our payment platform. So that'll automate the whole payment process. Um, we're also, we found some really interesting things to work with in terms of a groups concept. So there are small shops that we've been working with and some of them are volunteer organizations. Um, a couple, in fact, are college students, uh, a bunch of them up in Boston, a bunch of them in Vancouver, Canada, who came together and created nonprofit organizations to tutor kids who are missing out on school because of all the school closures. So they initially worked from the model of like, they wanted to tutor the children of frontline workers um, and essential workers. And then they realized like all kids actually have some need for this. So they've put together volunteer programs to find college students, predominantly, but not limited to them, uh, who come on and just mentor in various ways, teach specific academic subjects or teach applying to college or sort of anything that is necessary that school kids are missing out on while they're not in classrooms these days. So, so we've built a feature where they can have their own page on our site and have their own um, kind of little semi-private area so that they can pull together all of their tutors and display them in one place and then make it easy for students who are participating with these nonprofit organizations to go ahead and find those teachers and then, and then work with them. Our standard model doesn't involve raising any hurdles or vetting users. They come to our platform, they create their profile. Over time, they'll be rated via our rating system. Um, but some organizations want to have a more strict method than that. So if they create a group, then they can choose manually specifically who is allowed in that group or not. And that's, that's a security and a comfort level for those organizations that we want to support while also allowing our general purpose community to just be wide open. Well, thanks, Ben. Yeah, well, thank it looks you, like a, a looks like a really useful platform, and how cool that it's built on Drupal. Oh yeah, Drupal. Uh, what uh, like what technology do you use for the video uh, conferencing part? So we actually use a service called Agora, and Agora is I I believe Agora is a WebRTC provider. So using their API, we embedded them in our site. We initially looked at just providing or, or running our own WebRTC system. But there was a lot of complexity in that. So in terms of building and releasing a usable site earlier, we found Agora was a good fit for our purposes. We also, in the messaging system here, which I really didn't talk about, is built on top of Sendbird. So that's also um, basically a third party API integration. Cool, thanks. Um, cool. Uh, thanks, everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Yay, Ben. Okay. Let me bring back the agenda. Wrong direction. Okay, our first full-size talk um, is uh, Scott, who you've already seen asking some questions, um, talking about OpsID, a data management system. So I will hop back out of the presenter role and okay. go away, Scott. Let's see. Second, it, it, it does <laughs> the bottom thing likes to jump on me a lot. Is there a shortcut for, for presentation? Let's see. 
No, that's not what I want. Um, give me a second. I'm trying to. There we go. All right, now I have it. Okay. Chrome tab. And um, actually, cancel that. Is that now? All right, there we go. Okay. Yep, Everyone can see me now? <clears throat> your presentation's coming through. Oh, I see you're presenting to everyone. I actually don't see your presentation. Tell your dog I feel the same way. Um, why is it not it's going to do what it's supposed to? I am presenting. Looks like you're presenting your meetup window. Because I see. Um, yeah. I, I, Stop presenting. Let me just present again. See if I can do choose this. The, choose the window that has your presentation in it. Yeah, that's what I did. Well, what we got was your meetup. Was the meetup. I know. Now you see it? You see my PowerPoint? We do. Okay, good. Okay. You're good to go. All right. So if anyone knows me, they know that I really love data. And throughout the years, I've had a fascination. And many, many years, years ago, I had a company as a hobby distributor. I distribute games and model kits. And I realized that everything was really about the data, that once I disconnected from the product, it's all information, and I can use that information for my own purposes. And I created a system, and all I needed was $40,000 and a microcomputer, and I had to learn how to program. I could have built this many years ago, and that wasn't happening. So over the years, I migrated and changed with the times to get what I want, but each time it seemed to be an almost impossible goal to get to. And so I now finally can put it together using everything we have. All the, <clears throat> using Drupal and MongoDB, I can get what I need. And I realized also with Drupal, WordPress, Magento, they're all really presenting data. And that's what we're really trying to do on a regular basis. So now it stands for, um, hold on, you don't see my slides? Is there anyone see my slides? No, we cannot see your slides. Can't see it. Now okay, we can. now we can. There we are. All right. So Omni, now since for Omni process systematic data, I'll take another acronym for that if you want. But it's really a management tool that uses Drupal for its power and MongoDB for data stores. This is not Drupal on Mongo. That's a whole different set of situation. And it's not what I'm doing. And for some reason, there we go, hang a second. Okay. okay. So if anyone doesn't know what Mongo is, it's a NoSQL database. And that means that rather than having um, tables and columns, you kind of tag it using a schema like J using JSON. And you can have infinite sub documents and so forth. And it's very scalable. And I really like it, like about it. It allows you to build for unknown data schema. And that's good for most people who are working with data because you really don't know what you're going to encounter. And we have a tendency now to serialize and cram everything into one data package or one, you know, one, one field. And then we have to extract it and it makes it hard to search. Now, I use Drupal because it has really great ACL. Um, Vass, you can't see the slides again? No, we can't see their slides again. Yeah, it's black. Ah, uh, okay. That's back. Ah, uh, you know what it is? The lab. Okay. It teaches me a lesson to use PowerPoint. Never again. Okay. So Drupal, we know, has great ACL. We know so it's thousands. black. You say it's a lag. It's, it's black. So is it just, did you do something to make it show up, Scott? Because Yes. Now, I went to another slide. And when I go to another slide, that's when it stops. Yeah, it might be like a, a video mode switch problem. So yeah. maybe if you take it out of full screen and just present the window. Maybe. I am. If I did full screen, it throw me out of the Google thing. The Google Okay, meeting. well, so I'll get we through this. Do you want to send someone a link to your slides? I uh, got to post can... it somewhere. They're local. Okay, 
So Drupal has great ACL, thousand modules, and a very stable CMS. Okay. And the, and what I'm gonna do is I'll just jump out of this. I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna share my um my actual Chrome my Chrome uh, window. And let's see. Where's my Chrome? Cancel, give me one second. Chrome tab, I'll be easier to settle. Okay. Okay. And I'll just read through my um <clears throat> my presentation. Okay. So the pain points the business face is the average executive really has no idea about data structure. They're oblivious to it. They don't know what it is. They put it together. <clears throat> and to make a custom driven data web app is hard, difficult, and expensive, especially for the non-professional, the non-data people to explain it to a data person, they leave a lot out. And my experience is data from vendors has always been poorly constructed and inconsistent. I actually had databases given to me where the length, width, and high, and length, width, and thickness of a chain was all in one column, and where they would use SS for sterling silver and SS for stainless steel. And it was pure garbage. I mean, you, you could not work with it. You had nothing but problems dealing with it. And it was frustrating. And I realized I'm not going to ever change them. So I started to work on means to do this. And I worked with a couple of iterations over the years, but they always didn't seem to work really well. And so I said, what can I do to make this better? So what, what Opsit does do is does, it does ma manage the data. It can import, export uh, content and data. It can sanitize the data. It can deliver that data through API. What I realized recently, what I'm really doing is I'm decoupling data from the CMS. I'm not talking about the ACL, which is important, or the regular content. I'm talking about attributes of products because it's important that they go together and they run in a workable way. Okay. And what are the functions you can do for this? Well, this can build a custom data app, inventory management. It can transfer data between websites or anything else. It can even run things from a purchase order through the product as in the store. I have a client who is an optical store in Forest Hills. Their, um, their customer service system, it was built in 1998 in Visual Basic, and I still help him out maintaining a Windows 98 machine. And that crashes, he's screwed, because it will not run on anything else. We've tried. So how do I do this? Well, I use the custom, we built custom MongoDB modules, but really it all came together when uh, J-Rock, Jacob there, demonstrated web forms a year or two ago and the new things it can do. And that's where the, everything went off as, wow, I can now do what I want. The biggest hurdle was making it so that the data forms in MongoDB can be seen without having to be able to custom form every time. A regular person is gonna have trouble doing that. So that's really what it, what it did it. And let's go to demo. So if you logged in as a regular user, you'd only see the uh, connections you want. I can add a new connection to MongoDB here. And it's called this, call this D9 drops. Because if people don't realize, Drupal 9 dropped today. Okay, and I'm gonna put the IP address, that's where my MongoDB instance, but this could be a connection to any MongoDB instance you have. And put um, D9 props and call the database. And if I wanted to, I could perform authentication on the database using um, MongoDB ACL. I could SSH into it. Um, since it's all in the controlled environments, I don't really have to worry about that. So I'm gonna go and connect to the system. Okay, so now I have that. And if anyone doesn't understand how MongoDB works, you have a database, inside a database you have a collection, inside a collection you have documents. Unlike SQL, we're not trying to be efficient in terms of um, data. We don't mind repeating ourselves. And if you understand how MongoDB works, you make a decision whether to put information in a document or sub-document or make a reference. They both work. So I'm gonna add a collection here. I'm gonna call this one, and I'm a comic collector, and we have a lot of comic collectors here. And helps if I spell things correctly. 
One reason why I don't do coding myself as much is I'm a poor, I'm a bad typist. So I'm gonna make the comic, and once we go into the collection, we want to add a document inside there. I'm gonna add. Okay. Okay. And I call this um publish sharks, and we'll know which it is. I'm gonna add one more. And I'm gonna be called title. Add one more. And um issue. Add one more. And then to that price. Now that's maybe the price I paid, but it doesn't really matter. Okay, and I'm actually going to remove one because I take that and I hit submit. Now, if you go back to the add document again, so I show, showed you one of the feature, I can choose from one key a single value, which means I can actually name the value. But the trouble is, you can only use a key name once in a level of documents and it'll mess up the next level. I can put an array or a sub document. I'm not going to delve into that because it's more into MongoDB. And we really don't have enough time in this. Now you want to make a data form out of this. Because this is what a regular user can use. So I'm going to select, okay, one comic. And I'm going to add a data form, because that's the collection I'm in. And you see here, I can I can name it. So I'm going to see comic, and I'm put it at comic four forty-five. Only because I've used so many of this before in practicing. And I put D comic. I don't have any conflicts and names. I'm going to select all. Now, if you notice, I can actually change the type of field I'm using, the validation required. But most of us on, the, on, on this meetup know what that means. I'm not going to delve into that. Let's save the changes. Okay. Now I'm going to go add a comic. And I'll do, let's say, Marvel. Okay. Amazing. Spider Man. Two points if someone tells me why this is a special issue. And $500. No one knows why 122 is a special issue. Well, make a comment. You win a Marvel no prize. Okay. Now I'm gonna make another collection because really I don't have to retype Marvel every time, and I don't know. What, and, and a lot of other pu publishers besides Marvel. So I'm gonna make one called Publisher. Okay. And I want to make a form for, let me make it go there and make a document. Okay. And really, all I really want is here is name. All I care about is the name of the publisher. Submit that. Okay. Go to data form manager. I'm going to go to publisher. Okay. 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 Now, one of the things that's neat about this, if you notice that I can check all, check one, I can build different forms for different reasons. Okay, because I may want to have someone who works for me whose job is only to add the price or to proofread the title or something else. Now what I really want to do, I'm going to make a quick segue here to show you how things actually work. So I'm going to go to structure, I'm going to web forms. I realize I'm logged in as the super admin on the site, and it's my dev site. Well, we go to here, we can see all the web forms get built from the front end which I think is a pretty cool way to do, do things. Go back. Okay. 
But now I want to do is I want to make it so that if I go into and I go back into um, forms, oh sorry, I'm doing a sign. Okay. I'm going to publish. I just want to add some information so we have it. So I'm going to show you the next function. Okay. Okay, something's happening here. I'm about to pub. Of course, whenever you do a demonstration, something always goes wrong. Okay, that's an older one I did and do Marvel. I'll leave the imprint off. Okay. I'll do TC. Okay. Okay. And then I'll do Dark Horse. Okay. Okay. So now I'm going to do a relationship. So no, and while there's nothing to do with Dr. Phil and relationship management, it does do this. So when I make a comic collection, okay, I want the publisher field to be populated by the publisher on this side, and I can choose where I want to go to MongoDB. Usually object ID is the best one, but you may want to put something else in, it's up to you. And I want the name to show. Okay. When I go here and I go back to data form manager, now I'm going to make a new form that uses that one under comic. Now this is all managing MongoDB from Drupal. Okay. Okay. Do add comic. If you see here, I have a relationship of what I can do. Now, if, you, if you're doing two or three titles or ten titles, you want to do a radio drop down. Um, it wasn't ready today, but we're working on an auto auto complete. Because one of the collections I have is from Internet Movie Internet IMDb, the Internet Movie Internet Movie Database, where I have thirteen thousand items that I can bring in, and that's what I d would do. Select that. And obviously, you don't want to have a drop-down box with 13,000 items on it. That doesn't really work well. Okay. So now we go to Add Comic. Okay. Now I did. I can go and I can check what I want, and now I can do that. Okay. So those are the basic things to get things going. That helps me build a collection. Sorry, where's my okay? Mouse disappears on me sometimes. Okay, where to go to now? Okay, there we go. Okay. So next thing we do is we want to import data. That's a really, a really good thing to do. And importing data, though, as I said earlier, you never know what type of data you get. And sometimes the data might be gigs long. So I can, I can do from a local system or from the server. I'm going to take one from the server, and I'm going to take one called data.tsv. I know it's in there. That's all the episodes from Intel Movie Database. I'm going to give this a new name and call it dEpi. I'm going to do next. And that's all I loaded on the local server because that's a large file. And I don't really want to spend time uploading it and worrying about it. I, I, you know, PHP issues. Now I want to sanitize that. By the way, if you go to that, you can always look it out. And the first thing I really want to do is select what I want to be my keys. And if you give this a second, so jump back down. 
And this also means whatever I can delete. Because there might be some, I may not really want this item. I don't know what movie it is or episode it is, but I may not really want it for some reason. It might be bad data. Sometimes when you get a CSV or a tab separated value, this could be, you know, spring release of products or something else that you don't really care about. So I'm gonna make, and then once I check on, it will delete it and not import it, okay? Even though this is 2001 entries, we're gonna add this to the existing database that's here. And here I can rename things. So I'm gonna create a new field. And I wanna call this, um, let's see, this one is episode, call it epi. Plus in MongoDB, if we can make shorter names, we can, it's better. And it'll, you know, one will just call it season. And this one, create a new field, call it epi num. Now, one problem we also have with data as you have no idea if the stuff you may want, that might be ampersands or other parentheses or other junk data that someone thought was a good idea to put into there. So we can replace this. I'm adding another function that if it sees comma separated inside the field, it will then parse that into an array. Um, right now, I don't need to do anything, save this. I'm going to go import. And this will take a second or two. So while it's importing, does anyone have any questions so far? Okay, not a question, all right. Is people still out there? <laughs> yeah, we're here. We're yeah, here. Yeah. Okay. okay. And we'll give it a second to import. Now, one of the other things you can also do is import a database by itself for whatever reason or collection, and we import it. I said you can name it, you can join it to another collection. And so the idea is to make this so that a average user can quickly learn and build up the forms they need. They don't have to have our degree of skills because having our degree of skills can be a problem at times. Okay, so you see that imported. Now we have 13,790 entries. And let's say we go to view something here. So now you can see all the information nice and neat. You don't have to see it in a more, more Mongolesque fashion, which would be like this. But this is also good because you may want to have an extra field for this particular record. And we're talking about TV shows, maybe this is the first appearance of, let's say, um, Peter Falk or you know Robert Redford, if you're talking about the old Twilight Zones or the old Naked Cities and so forth. Or maybe someone else, maybe, you know, in growing, growing pains, you had uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's his first appearance. Who knows what you want to put in here? You know, um, last episode of the series before someone passed away. And whatever you want to do, you can do this. But you can, and I'm using examples specific to what I'm talking about. But you can imagine this for almost anything you want. Now let's grab, um, let's go back. By the way, you can also see the JSON for anything you're doing. And let's go back to here. And let's see, go to view. I'll grab this. I'll show you the search function. Okay. This will search the entire database and return any every instance. So this is helpful if you don't know where something is. Um, okay. So now I'm gonna jump out of this. I'm gonna close this database. And I jump to another database that has more items in it to show you something. So one of the things I built was called as a widget. A widget is a set of predetermined operations so that you don't have to go and build the only relations you want to. 
but not be slow and so forth. And one of the ones they built was called Container. And this is for anyone, it's designed for a lot of people to sell conventions. They constantly packing, unpacking boxes and they can never find where something is because it's not like a store where they have a storeroom and mark shelves. So we have containers and that could be anywhere from a cardboard box to a bin, to a van, to a place on location. But I look here and I can say, oh, okay, here's the product UPC. This is the, con this is the container I'm looking at. These are the items in the container. This will be placed when you mouse over, it'll show up the information, but this now goes to the actual product. And it tells me what I have in the sub documents, where it is, and goes back to the container again. Okay. The widgets are set up here under container management product. This is something that you go into the opposite marketplace saying, I want this functionality. You click it and it just passes into your system. Okay. I can upload a container and the container file would look like, um, let's see, I have one here. Let's see in a second. Oh. So the container, in this case, the container has a UPC code that begins with C and the system when it cycles through says, okay, I see this C so I know everything else that's following the UPC codes belongs to that container until I get to the next container and I start again. And then uploads and if, if you're using check-in mode, it looks to see if you have a UPC code on your system. If it does, and then it will add or detract from the um, product document or move it to where it belongs to. If the UPC code's not there, I'll add it. And if the UPC code's not is there but not in the list format, it will increment it so you can track it later on. And um, that's how that works. Let's see, what else do we have to go over? Oh, I'm sure to that, that. And that's the basis. I mean, this is still in development. That's why some of the things are a little off. I'm hoping to have a, I'm having some alpha start, people starting next week, some friends of mine who are a little more feeling and, and knowing that things may break and have problematic. And I'll do some beta later on. Um, in the near future, we we'll be able to do um, a database migrator from let's say WordPress to Drupal to Magento. You can control and push information to all the, any API you want. So this could be at your headquarters for all your products. You can push to Amazon, to eBay, to, Am to Facebook. You can pull in data metrics. You can see everything in one place. If it's data, this can control it. This can do everything you want. Um, let's see what else. Okay. Um, we're gonna, next thing we're also building is a cross connection to Drupal content. So I can pull the content in from Drupal and drop that into MongoDB and vice versa. But I also can have a connector. So let's say I'm building my site for my dragon business and I have a orange geode standing incense burner. Rather than trying to figure out how to build all the attributes in Drupal Commerce, I build the attributes in MongoDB and I link it by using object ID and Drupal ID. So that will be dropped into it. So I get the power of what I want to do. Let me show you my, this I do want to show you, hold on. So let's say I go down to products here. I go to the keys. The keys are the equivalent of a column in a SQL database. This shows me everything's in here. Now, if I clicked on vendor, I would know what vendor, I would see all the vendors I have and I can go find all the vendor products. This is useful for a CRM because you might find people have skills and say Node.js if you're tracking uh, developer skills or people public speaking or any key that you can think of on the fly you can put in and see that key later on. This way you make a note of someone you met two years later, you remember some, you met someone who did something you just don't remember. If you go through all your keys, they'll probably t hit your intelligence and hit your memory so you understand what it is. Um, what else do we have? And that's about it. We have a lot of other neat stuff going in, connection to remote DBs, so you can pull in, you can transfer MySQL data, um, APIs for WordPress, Magento, Shopify. And that's about it. I mean, there's more I can show you, but I've been going on for uh, close to 40 minutes. And I figure let, let people ask some questions. Yeah, let's have some questions. Okay, let me stop presenting.
So who has questions? Got to be someone out there, especially I planted some people in the audience. <laughs> How do you um, store the credentials and the for the Mongo stuff? Okay, when well, we were doing, for, we're storing right now an encrypted database. We're trying to find a better way of doing that because it was not good. Originally, we uploaded the um, private key to my server, and I realized that's not really a good idea. So I did some research. I'm going to do a browser-based key to see if that works. That's one of the areas I really need some help on to figure a secure way of doing that because I don't want someone breaking into my server. They have access to thousands of other people's items. I can secure it when it's in my environment, but I have no real way of securing it if your MongoDB is in your environment or your database in your environment. So I'm looking for some feedback on that. Well, you might have a look at, if you're in Drupal 8, it looks like you already might have a look, look at key module. Okay. Um, uh, the, out of the box, it allows um, storage and uh, file system. Uh, but okay. it also, it also, there are other extension modules that let you hook up with uh, key value storage services. But let's um, say I, let's say I want to get to remote, uh, remote DB that has a public key. I don't want to put the private key on my server. That's why I'm using a browser-based one. But how would I do that? Well, you could store the private. You could store the private. If you don't want to put the public the private key on your server, you could store the private key at a third-party key value store. Okay. Um, and pull it in when you need it. Um, okay. Uh, you, no. So, conceivably, you could write a plugin and store it in state, so it's in the database, but it's not in the file system. It's better than configuration, but. Um, the key module is very well written. I've used it for a number of projects. I shall look at it. And that's available for eight. John? The, yeah, this is really yeah, 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 yeah. I mean the key yeah. module. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Key module is uh, Awesome. Uh, I forgot my follow up. Uh, it was about the um, existing Mongo driver stuff in Drupal. Um, I honestly, I, I don't remember much, but I remember with seven, it was like a big deal that you could plug a, plug in different storage engines. Um, I know, you know, CHX worked really hard on that stuff. So I, I guess I'm wondering is it sounds like you basically wrote kind of a direct connect within your custom code. No, as opposed it, to or it goes you to use any of the Drupal API stuff. We, we, so we uh, so we do from Drupal. Reads goes in the API to our MongoDB API server, which then goes to the server. So they're all separate. I'm about to redo that and update all the drivers. Now that everything's working, I'm going to switch out and see if it works. I have the ability to change where the API server is whenever we want in the back end. And the planning for that was eventually, when it gets to production levels, enterprise, to put that into load balancers and other such stuff to keep track of it. But yeah, and going to get to the next level introduce Mon uh, using Mongoose rather than direct. And, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a bit of a marathon. As you know, in your presentation you're going to give, I know how long you've been working on that. And so, <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, no pressure, Scott. It's okay. We're not going to, we're not, uh, we're not, <laughs> no, no, I know. I, I, we're not I, demanding I know. any features. Yeah. From you. No, no, I know. I know it's, I, I take one little step at a time and make sure something works. Then I move yeah, yeah, yeah. a little bit better. And if I have to put a couple of gippers in now and then, I don't mind yep. as long as I <laughs> remove them afterwards. Gippers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's like a pro tip. Like if the, the whatever you can do to figure out a technology, even if it's quick and dirty, is like you get it done. And that'll help right. your brain kind of internalize how that stuff works. So uh, very mean, cool. Just last week when getting ready for this, I went to load the large database and it would just crash the server because Instead of using um, instead of using um, limits, it was loading everything all at once, and that was not a good thing. And you know, it's kind of I should specify that to the team developing. You know, pay attention. Let's test beyond three items. When you get to ten thousand items, things might behave differently. Well, you look like you're just out in the see. John is. You can definitely say John is outstanding in his field. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, any other questions or helpful hints for me? I'm not shy. I don't have an ego. Um, I'm curious about the, the decision to use MongoDB. 
as opposed to SQL or as opposed to other non-SQL databases? As opposed to SQL. SQL is too rigid. So one approach is going to happen, and this started with something called Quantax. You and I have met, so you know I live in Forest Hills, and, and I used to live in Forest Hills. How do you codify that into a standard CRM when you met, met me? You meet somebody, you have little notes you want to take. You know, no SQL is more like a notepad where you can write everything you want. Once upon a time, I had something called a day timer, which I still have my day timers from the 80s. If I met someone, I just wrote their information, the birthdays, their interests, and so forth. And I had a meeting with them again later. I go and reference and say, oh, yeah, I remember you. Uh, last time you were here, your car got towed. And the guy's amazed. How do you remember that? Oh, suddenly he's your best friend now because you remembered him. So how do you put that into that? So with MongoDB, I can add a key value whenever I want. That's in probably next week we'll have that in where we can add a key value, a key and a value to anything you want. So I can go back later on saying, I met Vasil, what's my data on him? I don't have to have a structure. Like if you use um, Goldmine or one of the other main CR, even Salesforce, you're stuck with fields that they, that they have, unless you build custom ones. And I don't want to have a custom field for everybody. I may only want to know a couple of people who do kayaking like I do, you know, or bike ridings or anything else. So that's why I decided to no, use a NoSQL. And really the first time I encountered a NoSQL type database was way back in 91, something called T Tornado. And you type information onto little car virtual cards and then you would search for keywords and that keywords on the card would show up. I had no idea what that was. I was just barely getting to databases at the time. But that idea always stuck with me. And I think it's a great way of, do of doing it. That's cool, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Hey Scott, it's Doug. Hey Doug. How you doing? Um, this, when you did the import, I wanna make sure I followed uh, exactly what you did. Were you were those nodes essentially? Those were like uh, you said, thirteen thousand five hundred records. Were those like the you know content type comic book, and then those end up in a Drupal table or what? No. So I, I, I was importing a, a tab separated value system, which is like a CSV. That was a right. flat file that I loaded onto my server because it was quite large. I imported that into the system. And that made it into first a MongoDB, and I took that MongoDB and I renamed it into into what I wanted, or annotated it to a car, uh, an existing database. So I have the choice of what I want to do with the data. So for instance, I have the entire um, .com TLD database. I'm going to parse it out, get rid of all the duplicates, bring that in, and build a system. So if you search by keyword, you can see if, this, if the site's live or not. So if somebody's looking for, I don't know, other union websites are out there and you want to market to them, you can find out if it's live and then go to the website and get information. But how do you import a huge database? How do you import millions of lines? I'm not going to upload that through the, the, the website and put that on the server. But yes, those are all separate bits of information, um, records that are on the system. But then I can build a relationship between them in another way. And also coming up is once they build a relationship, I can then select how to build a document with sub documents. I got to figure out the math on that one now. That that's what will keep me awake for the next couple of days. Okay. Okay. Hope did I answer you or no? Or did I once again? <laughs> uh, speaking of some, did I answer your question, Doug, or no? Yeah, I think I. I I think so. So the what was the thirteen thousand five hundred? I mean, they're comic books, right? Isn't that what the no, data those, those, object those, was? In, no, in, that was not what comic. Was I, what was in the flat file? I guess that's what I, I'm sorry. I'm, all, I the, all, that. all the episodes on the TV shows that ever existed. Oh, so yeah. there are approximately fourteen thousand episodic TV shows in the internet internet movie database. You can get the entire flat file oh, okay. the, the database as long as you don't use it for commercial purpose. I'm using it for an example, so I'm allowed to. I also have a large database. And then the Drupal, yeah. Sorry, go on. The Drupal, the Drupal side, it's letting you uh, show it, though, right? Correct. I mean, isn't that the hookup? Yes. Or did I, okay. 
perfect. The Drupal side allows me to control it, allows me to, to apply an access control list. I can make groups. I can walk around. I'm going to flip it around and make it so that any Drupal content can be linked to it. So while the content should stay in Drupal, if you're writing an article. So and I just tried to call me, though. OK. Um, but also ways you can manipulate and do it. And I'll probably do a follow up this in about six months when the item start when it starts. Re I'm about to do a uh, release candidate. By the way, I'm looking for co-founders co and other people who want to assist on this because from the people I've spoken to out there, this is a very large market. So I, I need other developers. I can't do it all by myself. Well, at least I, I, I'm trying not to do it by myself. Okay. Um, anyone else? Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Appreciate your sharing your your evolving project. Um, it's got some interesting aspects there. And now I'm looking forward to John's presentations. Yes, um, John Pugh is up next. But just for a moment, present my entire screen uh, because. We had, as you said, we had this happen today. Yes. Look at that. Drupal 9.0.0. Yay. Yay. On time, um, as promised. Um, and so uh, if, if you have favorite modules that still need to run on Drupal 8.9 because they're not, they haven't had their deprecations removed, um, I'm sure those contributions will be welcome. All right, John Pugh, are you ready to roll? I think so. All right, sir. Hi. Can, I, can you hear me? It is yours. I can hear you. Cool. Your, audio, your video is a little, a little fuzzy, but we can hear you. That's OK. You're not going to look at that. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm on a different machine, so I'm going to present. Uh... <clears throat> By the way, John. That joke, I've been waiting all my life to make that joke at some point. <laughs> you absolutely got me no, that was the, good. The, the outstanding in the field. <laughs> yeah. Do you see my colleague there? Yes. The actual cows. <laughs> they moved in as the meeting was going. OK. Uh, great. Can you see my presentation now? Weird. We so can. How do I? Oh, good. Look at that. It's smart enough. Google is smart enough to put it in a little bit. OK. Hey, everyone. So this is um, really more of a session about kind of a rebranding and reintroduction of something some of you know I've been building and working on for a long time called DevShop. Um, and I'm going to basically kind of give y'all a summary of, of how we got here, uh, what I'm doing today, and kind of what the open source framework is going to look like um, as we modernize it this year. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so to start off, I'll just give everybody some context. Not everybody is part of this. Right? So in 2012, yeah, way back 2012, DevShop uh, I was first created as a module on Drupal.org. Um, basically, it's just a Drupal site that acts as a dashboard for other Drupal sites. Um, uh, I branded it as cloud hosting because it was like basically you could git push and the code would deploy. That was really what the cloud was all about. There were there was a lack of any better words, right? Uh, back then, it was as Agar as a Drupal six dashboard. Uh, it just leaned on the the whole Agar system. The team there maintained the Debian package, so we just installed the Debian and turned on a couple more modules, and you know, got it working. So a couple years later, we moved to an install script, so that because the Debian package is only Debian family, that we needed Red Hat families where more enterprise people were starting to get interested, and so. 
they wanted uh, to be able to work on Red Hat. So I started creating a standalone install script to go around the fact that maintaining Debian and Red Hat packages is, is a challenge. So things kept moving. Um, we started creating. Now, what, once you have like a thing that creates websites, you know, it's a web UI, but you also now have all of the back end stuff, right? So all the server config and scripts and setup and packages and all the Linux you know, backend stuff, like those tools started get becoming more and more important. So as time went on, we moved, we started building stuff to manage the servers themselves. So um, with Ansible and uh, we call them Agar cloud modules to allow new servers. This is a screenshot of like the standard Agar form, but you can check a box basically saying apply this role and this role to this server uh, because this was the clear kind of scope of the project of the, of Agar itself had had list, listed servers, but it started off with just web and database. Um, but in it, Agar itself was just a Drupal module that allowed this data schema. So you'd have like the server and the services that were aligned with it. So I saw that and was like, oh, we can just expand that. We added these checkboxes. We added more things to basically create a whole, uh, you know, a complete server management tool where you can create, update, delete, roll uh, servers and configure what, what things they should do, right? What roles they should have, they should play. So fast forward a couple more years, I started trying to kind of growing the business and, and trying to put more products together. So in about 2018, I, you know, announced this dot support and dot cloud services to kind of standardize the kind of dev shop uh, business offerings I was already kind of doing. And then um, after doing that kind of independently <clears throat> for a number of years, I am now the director of product uh, for open source for a company called Contigix, which is more of a parent company name. Most people, if they've ever heard of it, uh, it was called Black Mesh. So there's a lot we could talk about in there, but basically Black Mesh is the, was the preeminent kind of gov Drupal host. Like they, they really do have a, the ma massive like FedRAMP, all, all this high-end enterprise, both government and like corporate uh, hosting, they've really nailed it down. Um, they, they kind of, anyway, so we had a lot of alignment. We started talking uh, last year and they were recommitting to the Drupal community. They were rebuilding the Black Mesh brand to be the Drupal platform of the future. And uh, after many negotiations and a slight title change, adding open source, I am now director of product for the Black Mesh Drupal product, uh, which is Contigix Inc. And then so once that started happening, I realized all of this work was already kind of coming out this way. It was really a framework. Everything is all these components of different things. There's, there's all these pieces of this puzzle. Um, <clears throat> DevShop was never really a, a single box, a single product. Um, it really always was like, because it's Drupal itself, you could piece it together and build different interesting things out of it. So I really, after, you know, after a lot of thinking and a lot of many years of development, I realized we should really just go for it and brand it as a framework. And it was much easier to just call it the open source DevOps framework. Um, once I started, especially once I started looking at different projects like Symfony. And what does that mean? What do you mean framework? So a framework, this is often a debate. So right, Drupal is a CMS to some people, a content management system. And so it's like, if it's a blog, then it's a, it's a system, it's not, anyway, I got a little ahead of myself and stumbled over my own brain. Symphony are the components that Drupal builds on. So Symphony itself is a framework for building other web apps and building console applications. And it's a set of reusable PHP components. So there's like, I, I should have looked up the number, right? There's probably somewhere between 30 and 60 components that Symphony, the company, uh, like maintains that all get split out and can be used independently from console components running Drupal, con like those are things like Drupal console are built off it. Uh, Drush is built off the console components. Drupal, there's like dozens and dozens of components that Symphony is, are actually Symphony components that Drupal uses. And as you can see listed here, other web apps like 
whatever blah blah car is <laughs> i don't know that's the actual official symphony description spotify but i mean uh laravel there's a drupal and magento there's tons and tons of projects use symphony now and it's building blocks so symphony is the framework to build drupal drupal is a framework to build websites and web applications right it's a it's a free and open source content management framework written in php open source they they got their good marketing in there for the fact that it powers two and a half two point three percent this is directly on wikipedia um but that's the difference that's what a framework is right that's really what DevShop was. Like it was never the perfect product. It was never the polished Pantheon, you know, the perfect thing that was clearly an, a, 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 you know, clearly defined because like on purpose, <laughs> it was always a, a, a flexible thing. So I kind of lifted the symphony read me and kind of rebuilt it, rewrote it myself for what DevShop would be. Um, and so this is it. It's, and again, this is must, this is a presentation I'm actually doing research. So I'm asking for your feedback and um testing this out uh, and we're kind of this is kind of a product development phase right where we're repositioning and rebranding the, the the whole system uh as we as we make it take it into the next generation so let me know what you think of this <laughs> instead of it's a cloud thing it's it's an open source devops framework actually wow that's already wrong for web application no, it's for web applications like drupal uh set of reusable components written in PHP. Many components can be used independently to improve DevOps and testing on any system. So already I'm like, I want to edit that, <laughs> right? They're, they are tools to build your dream, like your ideal DevOps platform, okay? The mission is to provide it fully automated development systems admin experience right out of the box. Like it just works right out of the box but you can then tweak it and as flexible as possible. You can tweak it and modify it at, at mo modules. We leverage Ansible and Ansible Galaxy to have a standard server configuration, which is much like the Drupal. And we leverage Drupal for the web interface and the Symphony console for the CLI and other tools. The overall philosophy is simplicity, transparency, and compatibility. Okay, they're each component, it's the standard LAMP stack. Like we can then build out multiple web databases and multi-web heads and launch containers but it's at its core it manages apache it knows apache the database it works on that level so we don't have to deal with maintaining a kind of middleware layer like kubernetes or any of these things right we focus on the config of the server components themselves and then we are much it's much easier to then launch the containers and spin it off from there uh, an interesting thing about it is that it only kind of manages, it uses the default stuff for the LAMP stack, but for Drupal, it, it, the Drupal config is, is automated, so it can actually coexist with existing infrastructure people, like different enterprise, how you already use Puppet for their fleet or Chef, or they have management systems management tools. It, it can totally coexist with those as long as you don't conf, you know conflict these specific files. But, a lot of like our customers have used Puppet to keep the operating system up to date and keep the users up to date and keep the security in place. Uh, and then they're, they're happy to hand off the Drupal config to DevShop and Ansible. It's actually fine. Like <laughs> you don't need to build one master mega system uh, because it's, it's great for IT people because they use the tools they know and they solve the problems for the stuff they don't, which is the Drupal specific recipe building. So uh, I'm going to get through, I, I don't have many slides, so I'm going to jump into the component breakdown. Um, but so going backing up to this role thing, basically open dev shop, I'm the B I'm the benevolent dictator for life, just like Dries is the is the Drupal owner, always will be, he owns the trademark for Drupal, I'm going to own the trademark for dev shop and be that, you know, <laughs> happy leader uh that i don't necessarily i want to include more people and grow it uh but no one you know until someone is fully versed and can take it from there someone has to be that bdfl for the project uh but i as an employee i am fully on board director of product for the black uh, drupal products that we are building uh at the continuous things uh, company so these things are absolutely interrelated because if they have to, they work, 
they build on top of one another, just like you'd build Evolve Ed on Drupal. We're building Black Mesh on DevShop and, and using all the open source server technology, but with like the enterprise expertise, the, they own their own data centers. Like they own the computers, they run the computers, they run the networking. It's really impressive. And they have some of the best support teams for that high level of service of service. And we're bringing, so it's really great that we're coming together to kind of share the best of breed software with that and putting it into the implement, you know, that level of implementation that Black Mesh has with their customers. So yeah, that's the, this is about doing all the things. Like I always knew dev shop and like it should have everything in it and we can manage the entire thing. You can manage your whole cloud, your whole, all your sites, all your developers, all in one thing. Um, I always knew that was the vision. It was very challenging to kind of convey that to everybody. And it was always like a lot of always pushback saying like, you gotta be narrow and lean and maybe make it a testing tool, maybe make it a local tool. But I always knew like, do all the things. This is really what's needed. And being a framework is like the way I see forward to accomplish that. Um, <clears throat> so what does that mean? What are the, what are the components? So I'm literally working on the list right now, but we've already kind of developed them. So I'm going to um, kind of just give you a rough. I, I, I was thinking during Scott's talk that New York City meetups have always been like a little bit above and more technical, and maybe we should just embrace that. <laughs> Let's see if this even works. Oh, I'm not presenting the... Uh, I'm only presenting Chrome, isn't that right? So hold on a second. Yeah, okay. I'll just keep using Chrome then. Second. So it all starts from here, right? The README. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. There we go. Is it sharing this tab now? Yes. So this is the, everything is on GitHub. GitHub.com, open dev shop slash dev shop. It all starts from here. Here's the README, just like I just read. I'm going to put it, update this. Um, the components, you know, we've, there we go. <laughs> Okay, one of the cool things we did was put everything in a mono repo. So now everything is one big repo, including our Ansible roles, Docker files, and command line, and even the Drupal front end. So the DevMaster project is its own component. It, it makes it really easy to develop now. You can just go to the main repo, fork the whole thing, and edit everything from the back end to the front the roles, the Drupal code, everything. Um, the packages, the, the components I'm interested in telling you all about because the, these are the ones that are like going to be useful for other tools. So git split, it all started with git split. This is what empowered us to do um, everything, right? So, and, and this was inspired by, I really have to do better readmes, but it's inspired by the, it, it's using the exact same script um, and almost the same code as Drupal itself. Drupal core has a uh, separate repo with some backend tools that take Drupal core and spit out all these sub components. Um, this is a composer package that lets you do it built in. Actually, I forgot, I remember now. There's an easy way for me to show you all this stuff. So I'll start with just an overview. It will actually allow you, so this could actually be, this is a solves a problem for, could, could be used by Drupal core. 
it could be used by a Drupal site where you, that you're developing that you have a module that you want to push out to another repo. Like say you're developing this custom module, but it actually is a great contrib module. And so you want to have it in the same repo. So you could actually set that up to push to Drupal.org from a subfolder. Um, there's a lot of interesting things. And we're also going to add like an import to make it easier and easier to, because it's kind of, it grow, the more and more components come in uh, all the time. I'll, the composer come in. Uh, let's see what this does. Ah, yes. So this one's awesome. This is a simple trait uh, that makes the. Uh, we're gonna put uh, this is like <laughs> this. This composer common thing doesn't very, very does very little right now, but as an example, all you this is a trait that you simply you do the uh, uses and then that class can just. Is just aware of the repo that the code is running in. So you can just do like get commit and do things like that. So I can give an example of that down the road. Um, power process. This is an enhanced symphony process component that shows prettier output. It uh, shows it can. It's going to run uh, metadata. It's it's basically going to be a wrapper for every shell exec we, we're going to use. Uh, it can pipe content to another source, it can, so that when you run a command, for example, in your DevOps system, it can push the output to a dev shop site or GitHub or Slack, even um, things like that. And so everything is built on top of this, including like the testing tools and things like that. So when you see um, a very like the the YAML tasks command, it will just it will be it builds on this. Um, the GitHub API CLI uh, is what we use for deployments. I'll, I'll jump into an actual the, the the logs for the testing, so we will see it in action. Readme's are a pain in the butt. Uh, YAML tasks is really awesome. It is a lets you run. It lets you define your tests in a YAML file. Okay. And then so that your DevOps system is just using that. So in your Drupal code base, you just include this so that you don't have to put PHP CS standard PSR2 in your Jenkins file, right? Or in your GitHub Actions or your Travis. The developers have it, it's here. And so that uh, eliminates this source of instability in DevOps where the list of tests that need to be run changes. And it's in, or it's sometimes it's even in different repositories. So if your CI system, for example, has a different test and then the developers change it here, the CI system could still fail and all those things fall apart. Um, a really good example, a user of this is the VA project. Um, extremely big uh, tests file. This is open source project. I'll, I'll share a link in the slides. But basically, each of the steps of the Drupal deployment process, oh, I'm sorry, switching tabs. The VA.gov, this is, the, is VA.gov, the actual VA.gov website from the Department of Veterans Affairs. Every single commit runs the commands in this test.yaml file. Um, and every step of the Drupal deploy process is defined here so that we can track it in the CI system because this thing actually posts directly to GitHub and gives you the results. So the developers, whenever they push code, and I'll, I'll open up side by side to show you an example, it runs this thing and it pipes the results to the pull request. So they can see, did my composer install fail? Did the cache rebuild fail? Did the update hook fail? individually, all the way down to code sniffing, PHP lint, PHP unit, and they can maintain like all those silly options that they have to maintain in the code. So if that changes, if they're writing code that needs to change it, they can easily change it here, and you can see side by side with your site what's happening in the DevOps pipeline. And so this is just one example of how uh, uh, this YAML tasks component was written before the, this site was running in DevShop. 
it just creates a command called composer YAML tasks on any Drupal site. So you can run it anywhere. It was running in their Jenkins before. Now it's running in DevShop. But you could run it on, on any system, and it doesn't require DevShop. And so that's kind of the new mission of the uh, Dev framework. Uh, let's go back to the see what other components we have. So yeah, in addition to the to the um, packages, the composer packages, we've got um, Ansible roles and Docker files, and there's um, there's other components that aren't even in the um, in this repo yet. So I still have more work to do to like fold in components that are still repository, like the the hat we have the hat package um, to make testing easier. We've got all sorts of stuff. So um, yeah, let me open up the um, the CI. You can see the tests running in action, right? So components. Ah, the git. Let me start with the git split one. So every time I do a git push, it runs. All this stuff, and then a split monorepo command is just a very simple git split. So composer git split command kicks off. It reads. Uh, it uses the uh, environment from GitHub Actions to allow us to push to different repos. And then it outputs this summary. It looks up all of the, the, compo the repos we want to split in the composer JSON file to give you a summary. So that includes our documentation, uh, just a test repo, the dev master site, the Ansible roles, uh, the PHP stuff, and like our install script, other things. It looks. For, it installs the split sh binary. I'm looking. I'm looking at dr drums face right now because this is Drupal.org stuff. Like the, the Bitbucket, they have a whole Bitbucket Jenkins setup with a separate repo on Bitbucket that contains the split sh script that runs every time they merge to uh, the main branch. It, it spits out all these components by by running this. And so essentially, they have a command exactly like this, but it's hard coded. The list of repos. Well, it's not hard coded. It does a search and replace. It does. Core in order to determine the path to split, this tool allows you to kind of curate that list instead. And also, it means you don't have to have a composer JSON file like the Ansible roles. Um, and then that's it. It just split, runs through it. And uh, this is the command split sh light, which if you've ever used it, you'd recognize it. It basically just does a subtree split, but it's super fast. Uh, so that every single commit, we actually get branches pushed to every single one of these sub repos. So that's interesting. That's a fun feature too. So as we all contribute to this open source collaborative process, you can build out, you can add components, you can change components. The components depend on one another. So to changing YAML tasks, you have to change uh, the you know the power process thing at the same time. Like that code has to align and be compatible. So by having one main system, uh, it, it's really great for developing this platform and improving, making improvements across the board. So that's just the git split component. We test every other component <coughs> um, using its own little. We test every component individually. Since every, I'll show you, every subfolder is its own uh, little composer package, right? So we make sure to go in and test it running independently. So for example, our process, it just does a very simple test. It runs, this, this dot run script is a example script. And uh, this must pass and in order for it to work. And so you can kind of see that's the UX you get. We should update it to print force colors. But here's an interesting one. Uh, we try to do an RMRF, and it catches the failure because that command actually does return a bad exit code. 
Uh, and what's interesting here, yeah, I could, could, you get the exact output and can do things with it. So that that process, uh, YAML tasks is the one on top of that. This one is the most <laughs> because it interacts with GitHub as well. So this actually not only runs the, the tasks, but it is used to do the CI tests for itself. So when you run the command uh, YAML tasks, you can pass it any file you want, and it will show you this information. And then it reads the task.yaml file, and it runs each individual command in a hopefully relatively readable way, <laughs> right? Where it's like, here's the command, it's running this command, and then here's the output of the actual command. And that's just super basic one, of course, but then we do a uh, more complex one down here where we actually do the linting, uh, PHP CS. We output the environment just to confirm that there's like an environment variable there. Uh, a GitHub comment test is all, all sorts of things. So once you have this kind of canvas to write tests, it's really quite easy to start adding more things to just ver verify your code is working right. You know, like put the command in for composer to val verify that the lock file is up to date or like anything else, you know, will help you in your process uh, to catch problems. So, um, yeah, so that's the YAML tasks. And what's really neat is, yeah, see this GitHub status part? It will actually post the output to a GitHub comment so that developers in the PRs can see the exact, uh, without having to log into the server, whatever, wherever that server may be, um, Oh, I deleted that comment. Yeah, the comment, we actually removed the, <laughs> the comments thing is optional because you can get a lot of comments. Uh, but let me actually, oh, good, best example. Is the uh, VA. So every time they do a check, a push, boom. So each of those little, uh, each of those entries in YAML tasks in their tasks.yaml file gets posted directly to GitHub as an independent test. And it shows up green or red. So it's like, this is, this is exactly what DevOps is all about. Giving the developers the power to control the operations, right? And so this tool, it's not DevShop. It can do, you can run it anywhere. Um, and you can do it for all sorts of stuff. You can use it for all sorts of things too. It's very interesting. Um, like for example, Elijah actually used it for um, curating a list of uh, cron jobs. So they had like, they wanted to, the de they wanted to give the developers control. Let me see if it's, if it made it, if it merged or not. Yeah, tasks periodic. So they gave the developers control to say, hey, these are run nightly, these are run, et cetera. And so that they set up their cron to run the composer, YAML tasks, VA background, this command specifically. And then so that the developers now have a space that they can add whatever they want to nightly or whatever commands, 15 minute or, or the 15 minute command. So that was really clever, I thought. A little clever use case of that. Uh, and that's YAML tasks. So we're going to kind of promote that as a standard, as the new standard way to, to run tests. The GitHub API CLI uh, was another cool one. This one is for deployments. <clears throat> so uh, let me show you how actually from the use. Oh, sorry, I keep getting switch tabs back. GitHub API CLI. <laughs> it is a very basic command line interface to the GitHub API. So you can just type GitHub who am I or GitHub uh, PR list. There's also, it'll post it directly um, using the GitHub token as in the environment and just spit out the information. 
And so we were able to expand on that by adding in um, deploy actions, or uh, which is a GitHub feature that keeps track of where your stuff is going. So if you actually go to your homepage and you click uh, environments here, this link, there it is. So this is a GitHub feature, but we're using the our tool to interact with the API, and it's a very relatively simple command. And I can I, we can I can show you where the command is to create and update the status um, of those tests. Uh, let's find it. Uh, it's in the build and test job, which does the full thing for. Let's make sure we use the right. No, oh, actually, the failure is good because we want to demonstrate how it'll ping a deploy fail. Okay. So the task is written. This particular job is building a Docker container. Okay. Uh, Oh, wait, no, that's not where it is. Hold on a second. Where do we actually use this deployment thing? Build. Yeah, sorry about that. It's a build job. <laughs> All right. So we'll start with the failure. There's a build failure here. And if we look at the... Let's go look at the environment, see if we can find that failed job that was... Kind of go back. Yeah. So here we actually just created a separate step to create the deployment. And so this is literally just in GitHub, deployment start, dash dash environment. And what you end up getting is cool little deployment indicators in addition um, that look, look like this. Okay, so DevShopBot had a problem deploying to this environment. Okay, so that actually allows you to say, give the developers links and to tell them what happened and where. And then eventually, it'll work, and they'll they'll be they'll see that, and you can see even GitHub has this whole list of environments. Oh, I did it again. Apologies. Uh, there it is. See, so it will actually pro GitHub provides a UI to developers that says Git DevShop Bot had a problem deploying to this environment. Um, because it actually did. So in addition to the tests, all these tests, now we have specific back in, uh, input even, and now that's an interesting point. Like other tools, Travis, Docker, Hub itself are running tests on this commit. So we can see all of them in one place. Very, very cool um, for quality control. And then once it works, you get to see Deploy created. Deploy created successfully. And so what's really interesting is you could actually wire this up using Pantheon scripts and pass the URL for your Pantheon site. Because all it is, it's a URL, it's a link. This, uh, hold on, that's the start. So let's do the update. If you do a, uh, So install, right before it installs it, it does the deploy update, where it does state in progress, and the, the, uh, the GitHub UI will change. And you can pass more than one URL, actually. You can pass the log URL, which gives users a link to like the, the, the log output, and you can pass um, the 
URL. I guess the environment URL is in a different command, but there is an environment URL option as well. There it is, environment URL. So this would be like your dev. This could be dev.mysite.com, or it could be your devsite.pantheonio.com or whatever. But the point is, it's decoupled. You can use it wherever. We now use it. We're going to set it up to be work with DevShop directly with no extra setup, but you could plug it into your Jenkins or whatever you might want to do just to get that transparency. And that is the GitHub API component. Um, so I think that's pretty much all I want to show today. <laughs> Um, do all the things, you know, um, this will all culminate, oh, John, this is all uh, leading towards a better, uh, a better overall platform. So that's quite that's a, my, yeah. quite a pivot from, uh, where you've been to where you are now. Um, how has that experience been for you, uh, pivoting from, uh, sort of a startup to a, a, a product? Or an open source. Oh, framework. you mean in terms of like the job? <laughs> oh, just just personally. Uh, no, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, 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 at first when you said pivot, I thought you meant more of the technical, like frame to, to a framework type of pivot. And the answer to that one would be, well, that that was natural. <laughs> that was the natural right. growth. But the the yeah, personally going yeah, being doing the startup, you know, independent to to um, a place like Contigix. I mean. I've been always been I've been enterprise adjacent for a long time, <laughs> so I feel like I've been ready. Um, uh, and so it is very exciting, and it, but it's also a whole new world of challenges, right? Because I'm working within the, the, the this enterprise organization itself. So our customers are an enterprise; we are an enterprise, <laughs> you know. So they can't change that fast. Like I have to. I'm. I'm. We're. We're still developing products and. I am being a good corporate citizen and learning to be better every day. <laughs> and also, but also, you know, um, trying to be fearless and teach them and try to bring them into the, you know, into the future and take an honest look at themselves and modernize things. And, um, but it's been great. Yeah. This is on a, it's been uh, personally, it's like cliche, but it's a dream come true so far. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Other questions from the community? Hey, John. Shake. What's going on? Hey, um, how are you? I'm curious. I, I'm I'm curious where you see the UI going. You know, with Drupal nine out. I know you you use Drupal seven to build the UI for managing yeah. the site. Um, yeah. What direction? I, what direction are you going in? I mean, I also, by the way, I, I'm not trying to get. I, I would say you should look at all the options. I mean, Drupal's. You're building a lot of smaller components to manage the backend system. Mm -hmm. And if you go in a more API first kind of thought, I don't know if Drupal's the best. You know, is that the right tool or Drupal eight or how? You know, you're gonna have yeah, to yeah, yeah. do a lot of code. So I'm wondering where. What are you thinking? And yeah, no, that's that. a great question because it's that's exactly why decoupling has been so useful like like pulling out the components is like clearing the the road for me to put it into anything i want <laughs> you know mm -hmm. uh like it the, the interface from the back end to the front is now ansible so it doesn't i don't have to rewrite much at all to have a drupal 8 9 version essentially prototype pretty quick and and if you look at i even have it like there's all these other projects I started over the years that were sure. bits and pieces of that. So I already have some Drupal 8 code that is like the server node, you know, and like the site node. And so I think it's that's where it's really headed is as a framework, we are going to have Drupal modules, well, they'll, but it'll be independent, like a, a Drupal, a, 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 a standard server node in Drupal 9 content type. Would, mm -hmm. would be useful for so many things, even Scott's thing, right? Um, and there's so many other pe places that use Drupal for managing infrastructure in different interesting ways um, that that's where I think it's going. Yeah, and I'm trying to 
make everything packages, <laughs> packages, packages, so that it'll, it, you know, the migration to a, a, a D9 interface is, is fast, will be faster. But the cool part is that the core functionality of it, if it's just in a composer package, you could drop a feature, for example. Check this out. The, the, uh, the repository aware trait, that can go drop in any PHP class, and then it gives you a standard way to list the Git log, for example. Mm -hmm. You could just add that to WordPress or add that to whatever project, and then boom, you have like a page in your app that actually shows the Git history of your app in that environment, whatever that may be, right? And so that, that, that's kind of the thinking is like, each piece of this puzzle is like really cool and useful if you break it apart. Um, you know? No, that makes so, total I, sense. Yeah. So I see, I see other tools as cool. Like Laravel has some really interesting server tools. Like they really are stronger in DevOps, frankly, in the tools they provide to their communities. Things like Laravel, uh, Typo3, I think has really good, has like official VMs and things like that. So there's other open source projects, frameworks and things, CMSs and things that have, are a little bit ahead of Drupal in terms of providing those developer tools. So I think that's where we're trying to fill in the gaps and uh, we, we learn, we're learning from them as well. But in terms of the specific question, is Drupal really the best option for that? Turns out, yes. <laughs> like user management, identity and access management, plugging into any login system in the planet, like oh, open ID, <laughs> like CAS, SSO, SAML. Um, there are so many things that Drupal provides that you need in that web dashboard uh, that it is continues to prove that uh, to be the best choice for that thing. That doesn't mean people shouldn't try other things. I'm all about it. But like, even if you're, you want to build, oh, we want to build a, the best React dashboard instead, you still need that. You still need a user backend. You still need authentication. You know, so I, I imagine it all. Here's another point I wanted to make. A lot of these tools could be language agnostic. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> YAML tasks, literally all it's doing is parsing the YAML and running shell exec. There could be an NPM YAML tasks. I don't, I can't maintain it, but the community could. The same repo could have Composer and JSON in it and both be publishing to NPM and, and PHP because it's this tool is so simple, the scope is defined. Um, I'm trying, I, I think there's interesting opportunities for collaboration there between the node and PHP communities in that respect. So I do, I do keep consider that in, in the scope. <laughs> yeah, no, I, anyway, I sorry yeah. for the rambling answer. It's good to hear your voice, Jake. No, I wanted to give you a chance to ramble. <laughs> I want to hear what's going on. <laughs> Thank you. And Does that answer your question? Yeah. That like what you're thinking, how you're approaching it, the breaking it down into smaller parts. Yeah. But then you're justifying the, the key parts of Drupal. I, I just hope that Drupal 10 doesn't make you have to rewrite everything. Or I, I think I'm in the boat of like <laughs> That's a lot a of theory. people. <laughs> That's the theory of Drupal 9 is, and, and, you know, is that it, once we're in Drupal 9, like the, com the compatibility may, you know, is going to be set for the future. So I feel like I'm going to toy around with it this week. I, but I'm here because I'm on vacation, actually, on a working vacation mm -hmm. where I'm going to do some really creative, like high level stuff. In the Catskills, so um, cool. Everyone try to take yeah. a break once in a while. <laughs> I encourage yeah. it. I haven't and, done this in forever, and I feel amazing. After and, and, and Sean said that's why I chose Drupal for my front end, and I'm planning to use Dev Shop in the next stages of what I'm doing because I see the compatibility cool. and be able to extend it to what I need to do. It's so much fun. Like you can extend. There's no limit. You can edit blocks, and you can do so much. Yeah. So. Cool. Um, I'm else? really excited about getting it up, getting it up to date because it's yeah. I mean, there are lines of code in there that are the same from Drupal six days. You know, it it didn't need to change much, <laughs> so it didn't. So soon, soon enough. Um, you know, I'll do follow ups with more like hands on technical stuff in the future, but I wanted this to be very high level. No, we appreciate it very much, John. You're you've been creating in this space for a long time. Thank you. Oh, and I should pitch. Uh, we are posting an official biz dev position uh, for this new world we're building uh, for Drupal. And it's like really community, someone in the community and like knows that knows the space. It's like going to be really exciting, preferably East Coast-ish, New York-ish. Um, I mean, of course, we are going to hire all of you eventually, but 
corporation. So like <laughs> the, the job description has been approved and I was told it's being posted today. So I'll try to put it out to the feeds. Um, but this would be like, yeah, like, I mean, this is, they're ready. They're enterprise, their customers are big time. So it's going to be fun. And I, I just, my, my job is like to keep the cool stuff flowing to all the free people. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, hit me up. <clears throat> you know, any interesting parties. And that's my session, and I think that's the last session. I, you want me to MC the last the slides? <laughs> um, Do we have anything else other than the? No, um, I need to get. I'm just trying to get the slide back up. No. Bill's Burgers is downstairs yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and across the hallway, or there's some burgers back there. Uh, just kidding. Uh, this is the actually I like the the slide was updated to say to officially designate this as awkward virtual socialization or something, right? <laughs> where we where we're like, oh hey, <laughs> Kaling, what's up? Hey. What up Kaling? <laughs> Everybody <laughs> unmutes and we all just start chatting. <laughs> so, welcome back, Ben. By the way, so glad to see you back in the community. Yes. Can I yeah. ask? Can I ask a question? <laughs> Sure. I wanted to ask Drum about the Drupal org stuff and what he might think about the Git splitting process. Uh, yeah, I got to work on that process quite a bit since uh, my coworker who built it went on maternity leave for a few weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, it also does the uh, uh, mock file generation and like recombining the splits afterwards into a different package so it's interesting yeah it's not yes. just this when i playing stuff out it was really wild learning about mono repos and realizing there's no one way and no one does it the same way every mono repo does it slightly differently uh like neil was mentioning it's like we ignore lock files because each component shouldn't have the lock file like symphony for example it doesn't include it for each component because it wants your app to sort out which exactly things to use. So I had to kind of, I actually read through your the, the git split code for Why? Drupal to, to kind of pull out the pieces that I knew I needed, I wanted. Yep. Um, yeah, since... But essentially, yeah, there's like a custom composer command, right? Or a custom composer script command to do that. Yeah, right it creates the lock files for like the if you do a composer create project core recommended core legacy, it, it makes the lock files and stuff for that. Um, right. And yeah, really, since the composer is added to Drupal, it's kind of an afterthought. I mean, Drupal's existed a whole lot longer than composer has. Uh, like we go through all of these things, uh, processes, so that we can make a version of Drupal, the uh, tarball you download on drupal.org that right, right. has continuity with what you would download before. But if you start a new project, you probably don't actually want to use that at all. You want the more modern uh, recommended project. That's right. It's the right word, using Composer. Right. So. Super. Yeah, I'm familiar well, with the pieces of that, but only the parts that broke slightly, and I muddled through fixing them. So I'm not really an so expert gonna, on it. I just know how to fix it. I'm going to run through the last little few announcements of the official meetup, and at the end, I'll be saying you can sit and chat as long as you like. So just hang on a second. So our next meetup is July 1st. Um, uh, online until uh, it's safe to be otherwise. Um, so please, uh, RSVPs are open now. You're welcome to sign yourself up. Um, please put in uh, something you can use to log into Google with as your email. Um, makes it e easier for everyone. Um, we need speakers, organizers, people to help make this work. So um, email us, speak at drupalnyc.org. And um, no, we can't go downstairs to Bill's Burgers, as much nice as all that, that always was. Um, uh, but you can have your after party uh, here in, in the cloud. Um, you're welcome to pour whatever beverage you wish, or you're welcome to go on about your evening. Um, but this link will stay live. This meeting will stay open for anybody who wishes to continue.
Thank you very much, and we'll see you next month. Bye. Thank you, you everybody. Later. Thank you. It is. Thank you. This is nice to 